Producer at Columbia. I recall his name was Jerry Tarkovsky. He called me and asked me if I'd be interested in representing Jim Brown. I was a big football fan. I thought Jim Brown was great. I felt he would be a major star, and particularly for action pictures. I really never acted. And he said, well, that's OK. We'll give you a screen test. So I said, oh, you good. Give me a screen test. <laughs> so they gave me a screen test, and I got this role. It was a Western. And that was my first film. It was called Rio Conchos. With Stuart Whitman, Tony Franciosa, Richard Boone. Well, I guess you're planning on becoming a general, too. <laughs> that really would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. I didn't know what was going on. And Richard Boone was great, Stuart Whitman was great, and Tony Franciosa was great. If they had not been that way, I don't think I could have ever got a line out. I didn't have too many lines. But uh, they made it easy and allowed me to, uh, you know, feel very comfortable. Bob Aldridge, the director, said, what else does he do besides handle a football? I said, Bob, he can run. Just, I know the script. Put the gun in his hand. He'll run faster than any of those other actors. He went to Europe to do that picture promising me and, and well-intentioned. He was not deceptive or du duplicitous. He was determined to come back and play football, but they ran into difficulty uh, weather and they had a delayed production. He called me and said, I can't come back. I can't come back until late September, October. I said, look, I can't make an exception. Now, Blanton, Collier, and I discussed it. Having him show up in October it would be unfair to the other players who went through the two a days of the ordeal of training camp. I told them that if they needed me, I would consider coming back. Art didn't pay that any attention. I was in the movie business. We were, we were late. He gave me an ultimatum. He sent Carol Rosenblum over to talk to me, who was the owner of the Colts, I think, at the time, Rosenblum. He came in, knew in two minutes I wasn't going back. But the ultimatum was embarrassing. The suspension would cost uh, Jim money uh, from the point of uh, uh, the suspension period. I said, I have to fine you $100 a day. That's lunch money today. And, uh, and he, he resented that. And the next day, he called a press conference, announced his retirement. I made a mistake. My original intention was to try and participate in the 1966 National Football League season. But due to circumstances, this is impossible. When I left, I left gloriously because it was fine. I had done nine years. I was MVP of the league, 29 years old, and we'd won the championship. 29 MVP and won the championship. I'm on my own terms. Harriet Tubman said something about uh, what she called African men who would, n who would not stand up. She said, I'm always looking for an African man that will, will, will stand up. And then when she would see a man, she would ask him this question, are you the one? So I think the dominant culture and management looked at Jim, and they didn't know that he was the one. They didn't know that he was going, you know, because most brothers, you tell them you're going to take their money, and they can't make no money, and they can't play no football, including me. You know, I don't exclude myself. And most of them, the professional athlete, if they get down, you, you, they're there because they're trying to get some money and some aspect of prestige. Why all these other guys do what they do is because they love the game so much and they narrow themselves down to the game. So their life and their, uh, 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 their whole persona is tied up in that particular profession. They identify so strongly and is such a high profile uh, a big money paying operation. They don't understand that their manhood and their freedom and their education to do many things is much more important than that. And that when you're playing a game, you're a gladiator. And your boss is up there. 
your ruler is up there. I don't want no rulers. I don't have any rulers now. You know, my owner is not over me. I make my choices. Before that time, I think, you know, athletes were really, particularly black athletes, were pigeonholed, stereotyped into a very narrow box. So that was sort of the beginning of taking the black athlete out of this role of just being sort of the beast, you know, just being the warrior, you know, just being the guy who tears you limb from limb, you know, on Sunday, and then you don't see him again until the next Sunday when he comes out of his cage. He did a real big breakthrough coming into Hollywood, not only as a black man, but as an athlete coming into the business, because there are a lot of athletes before him who came, also came at the same time that he did, who had the same notoriety. Watch out for Jim Brown. And making it in Hollywood means this is your primary job. This is your primary source of income. Anybody can come in and do a guest star and get the hell out. You see him on one show, and you, that don't make him a movie star. You see him in one movie, that don't make him that don't make him making a living. Jim actually made a living. After Dirty Dozen and a few other pictures, yeah, he, he was a major star. He brought in people. They realized he attracted an audience. The general public doesn't know it. But uh, I did a lot of things on screen. When I did uh, The Dirty Dozen, it was from a bestseller. Uh, when I did Ice Station Zebra, that part was not written for a black man. I'm Commander Faraday, Captain. Captain Anders, sir. Good to have you aboard. Thank you, sir. I did The Split with Gene Hackman and Ernest Borgnine and all those guys. The film was financed on me. And in fact, Tick, Tick, Tick opened good reviews from the, from the uh, New York Times. And so it was a part of what I wanted to be because I was not only making money and you know, dealing with pretty girls and shooting guns and riding horses. But as a black man in America, I uh, brought something to the screen that really hadn't been there consistently before. Jim was um, almost an old-time action-adventure hero, but for blacks. If you think of films in the 40s and Errol Flynn or someone like that, uh, bigger than life, Jim was like that. He was different than Sidney Poitier. You know, Sidney was sophisticated, charming. Jim was the one with the shirt off, fighting, dealing, getting down. Part of the reason for Brown's success is that, in a way, it's a reaction to the Sidney Poitier hero. Now, if you see him and guess who's coming to dinner, now he's super. He's intelligent. He's sophisticated. He's often enough well-educated. He's even got the best table manners. He's, in a way, perfect. Um, he also doesn't have a strongly defined sexuality. Sidney had uh, broken a lot of taboos. He had arrived, but he was not an action star. He was not superhero. He was not a lover. <laughs> he was kind of a nice guy. So I wanted to do all the things that we had never done before in films. It made a lot of pride with uh, black men in general to see one of their own up there fighting and, and, and doing things and standing up for something, and also be, being more than one dimensional, being with women. And you know, it was a great controversy when he was with Raquel Welsh. Dick Zanuck called me and he said, listen, uh, we want you to come over and talk to us about the casting, because we've got this amazing idea, and we, we feel very high on it. And it was like all big mysterious thing. And I go over to the studio to meet with him and he says, we'd like to put Jim Brown in the part. And I went, y you mean the football player? I spent 15 years in the 9th Cavalry, keeping the law and chasing bad Indians. But this one ain't my business, it ain't my fight, and it ain't my job. We should have killed him. She was a major, major star at that time. She was the sexiest woman in America. We did pictures together. I had my shirt off, and she'd be hanging around my neck. So we were trying to send a message to America, you know. First time this big black dude is hanging with this very beautiful white lady that's the darling of America from the standpoint of uh, sensuality and sexuality. When he makes 100 rifles with Raquel Welsh, then a reigning white sex symbol. He's going to take her to bed, and the audience is going to know that not only does he have a penis, but it's going to be erect, and that he's going to know how to use it. The love scene. Well, I don't know if everybody remembers this as well as I do, because there was one thing that I was really not expecting, and that is that the first day of shooting, they scheduled that love scene. 
And the truth of the matter is, is that every first day of a filming, you haven't got your legs yet. You don't know who you are. You haven't got a trust factor going. The juices aren't flowing. And you're not totally spontaneous and relaxed. I always figured Raquel wanted the camera, you know. Some people want their face in the camera. So I got my head on the other side and gave her all the camera. But I didn't really know what to do. So I think I stuck my tongue in her ear. <laughs> this whole thing that's happening over here where I'm getting, you know, sort of a squeegee on the side of my face. And I thought, what is this crap? Nobody does this, it's a real actor. I mean, it's a guy thing, basically. It's a very guy thing.